Yeah, so as you'll see, that, that uh, the, the solar dynamo has some subtleties that, that planetary dynamos don't. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, as uh, Dana said, I work upstairs. I work in HAO, High Altitude Observatory. Uh, our, our objective is to, or our purpose is to study the sun and its impact on the Earth, but part of that. It, so we're, we're really a microcosm of heliophysics from the sun to the Earth. Um, so I guess this morning I will start with planetary dynamos, and then this afternoon we'll talk about uh, the solar dynamo. Uh, but I'll start. Some of this will be review, just about what is a dynamo. You've already heard some of that um, this morning and yesterday, I guess. And then we'll talk about uh, the observed magnetic fields in the various planets of the solar system. And then we'll talk about some basics of convection in rotating spheres. And then we'll talk about numerical models that throughout this entire talk we'll be returning to this basic uh, concept of convection, that if you have a hot surface down here and a cold surface up here, warm fluid rises, cold fluid sinks. This is something you can see on any pot of stove. I, uh, people often describe it as a pot of... Uh, a pot of soup boiling on a stove. Boiling implies a phase transition, so I don't like to use the word boiling. But, um, but just a hot pot of soup on a stove or clouds in the atmosphere. So convection is something you can um, have a daily experience with. And the movement of hot fluid up and cold fluid down gives rise to an outward energy flux or an outward heat flux. We'll call that FC. So this uh, outward heat flux is key to driving dynamos both uh, in planets and in stars. So start out with what is a dynamo. So a dynamo is an object, for our purposes here, an object such as a star or planet that converts the kinetic energy of fluid motions into magnetic energy. So you've seen this already, the MHD induction equation, dBdt equals curl V cross B minus eta curl B. Uh, this comes based just from Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, uh, eta is the magnetic diff diffusivity, um, the electrical conductivity is sigma, and this is in the frame of the moving plasma, but when you um, do a Galilean transformation to the lab frame, that's where the V cross B comes from. But you've already seen this. And by the way, stop me at any time if you have questions. Uh, so maybe you've already talked about this, but dBdt, th this term here is a source of magnetic energy, and this is a sink. So how would you show that this is a source of magnetic energy and this is a sink? Any thoughts? Yeah, one's positive and one's negative, but how would you demonstrate that, well, this is positive, but V can have both signs and curl B can have either sign. Eta is always positive. But what's the magnetic energy? Yeah, B squared. So how do you get an equation for the magnetic energy? Yep, exactly. You, you, you dot this by B, and then... So the magnetic energy in CGS units is just B squared over 8 pi. So you dot this equation with B and have a sheet handy with lots of vector identities. And <laughs> you come out with this. The D by DT of the magnetic energy density is equal to, this is a pointing flux, E cross B. It has a term that comes from there and a term that comes from the diffusion. But the key is... This term here goes like J squared, the current density squared. So this, this is always negative. That's called ohmic heating. So, so that energy goes into the internal energy of the plasma, and it's taken away. So this is a conversion of magnetic energy into internal energy. It takes out the magnetic energy. Whereas this term, V dot J cross B, you might recognize J cross B as the Lorentz force. So there's a term in the momentum equation that looks like plus V over C dot J cross B. And so 
This is a conversion of kinetic energy into magnetic energy. All right, so that's the source. This is the sink of magnetic energy. And if you do, you may have done this already, sort of looking at um, sort of orders of magnitude of each of these terms. This goes like a velocity scale u times a magnetic field scale b divided by a length scale because of that curl. And this goes as eta b over d squared. So the ratio between these terms is the magnetic Reynolds number, which you've already seen, I think. And the idea is if magnetic Reynolds number is much bigger than one, then this term is bigger than that term. That's sort of true. But you have to be a little careful there, because what happens, as you heard in the last talk, that um, you can create very small scales in, in turbulent flows. So the length scale you use for the diffusion is this delta here instead of a global length scale like d. So, um, so a flow can make very small length scales, so this term can become comparable to that term. So it's not, even if the ma magnetic Reynolds number is big, it's not really obvious that you're going to have a dynamo, that the source term will win out over the sink term. It depends on the details of the object in question and the flow. But a uh, corollary on what is a dynamo is a dynamo must sustain the magnetic energy against ohmic dissipation. And th that's not always easy. Uh, so the need for a dynamo, you have your induction equation. If you set V equal to 0, you come out with just a, a diffusion equation. Uh, you might naively estimate the diffusion time scale as like a d squared over eta. If you do a more careful calculation for a planet, which is a spherical shell of fluid, there's another factor of pi squared here. But if you work this out, the diffusion time scale for Earth is about 80,000 years. For Jupiter, it's 30 million years. Uh, so these objects are a lot older than that. So in order, of, so they would have the magnetic field would have diffused by now if, if a dynamo wasn't sustaining it. So we do need a dynamo. And the conditions for a dynamo are, first of all, you need an electrically conducting fluid. And for stars, that's a plasma. For terrestrial planets, it's molten metal, mainly iron, liquid iron, which is a good conductor. It's even a better conductor than the plasma of, of the sun. Uh, Jovian planets, you have metallic hydrogen. Uh, and also, liquid molecular hydrogen is less conductive than metallic hydrogen, but it still might support some dynamo action. Um, in ice giants, you have this water, methane, ammonia, slush, or liquid uh, in their cores, which is not as good of a conductor, but it appears to be good enough for it to uh, conduct electricity. Icy moons, even. Salty water is a weak electrical conductor. It's not as good as liquid metal. But, um, but it's a conductor. And you need uh, fluid motions. These are usually generated by convection. Like I said, you heat the bottom, cool the top. And though I said you have to be a little bit careful with the magnetic Reynolds number, that, that just because it's big doesn't necessarily mean that you have a dynamo. But if it's small, you will not have a dynamo. So if, diffusion, if there's too much uh, ohmic diffusion, then, then it will kill your dynamo. So you do need the magnetic Reynolds number to be much bigger than 1. And these are not strictly necessary, but they help. Uh, rotation helps to build uh, strong large-scale fields. So this, this is the, uh, gives you the alpha effect that Amitava talked about. So it promotes magnetic self-organization. It can suppress convection, though this is not usually a problem for planets. So it can, it can be detrimental to dynamo action. And here, turbulence gives you chaotic fluid trajectories, which is usually good. It's good for stretching out the magnetic field. But it can also increase the ohmic dissipation. So it can be bad for a dynamo. It depends on the steepness of the velocity spectrum. If you have a very flat spectrum, then it can be too dissipative. But if you have a steep spectrum, so you have a lot of uh, quasi-laminar rolls that do a lot of stretching, then that, that works best. All right, so Earth, we know, has a dynamo. We know its field strength is on the order of uh, half a gauss on average. It gets up to a gauss near the poles. Uh, 
And you can quantify the degree to which it's dipolar. This is essentially a measure of how much magnetic energy is in the dipole component compared to everything else. And it's about 60% in the dipole. It has a tilt of about 10 degrees relative to the rotation axis. And so this is an archetypical example of a terrestrial planet. And we have a good, th this is the only planet where we have a pretty good idea of how it is varied with time over the course of, of uh, thousands, even millions of years. Uh, so direct measurements date back to the 1800s. This is an example of a magnetometer used by Alexander von Humboldt around 1800 when he went to Latin America and he measured the Earth's magnetic field. This was the first measurement of the magnetic equator of the Earth. Um, but today we also have satellite me measurements, so we know what the geomagnetic field is pretty well. And it's mostly dipole dominated. And of course we can infer the long time behavior. This was uh, really started in the 1960s, that it was noticed that the spreading of the continental crust due to an upwelling of magma, uh, that as this magma upwell it comes up at the base of the ocean floor, it's molten. So it feels the magnetic field of the Earth, and the, the iron atoms align with the magnetic field, and then it solidifies. And then these come up, and they spread out. The magma comes up and spreads out and solidifies. So you get bands of magnetized rocks that reflect the direction of the magnetic field. And you can take this back for millions of years. Uh, on, uh, this is in the Atlantic, but you can also do it in the Pacific. So we have a record for millions of years of the Earth's magnetic field. And we know that it, it uh, reverses roughly every 200,000 years. But oops, that should be another zero there. About every 200,000 years, but irregularly. So. There could be a long time between reversals or a short time. Um, and so you've seen, yep. Oh, yes, question. No, I, I think that there might be just, uh, so th th this here shows uh, an up, upwelling here, and then the time goes in both directions, to 10 in both directions. So this is kind of a double width here. So it's, it's sort of this, this, this big on this side, that big on that side. But, um, so that's why that band looks wider than all the others. Um, but, um, but yeah, there shouldn't be. I mean, symmetry reasons you'd expect there, that there shouldn't be a preferred polarity. But I don't know if we have enough data to really establish that. Because if, if it goes, if it reverses every 200,000 years, then in 10 million years, you don't, you don't have that many reversals for good statistics. Um, so you've seen the pictures of the interior of the Earth. You know that the mantle is convecting. And that's responsible for the plate tectonics. But it's not responsible for the geodynamo. And why do you think that is? Yeah. Exactly. It's not conducting. So the part that is conducting is the outer core. So the, the mantle, the overturning time in the mantle is on the order of 100 million years. The overturning time of the core, the liquid metal outer core, is about 500 years. It's a lot faster. And it's a very good conductor. So it's this part in the outer core that actually generates the magnetic field. And uh, a characteristic of planets, if you look at the convective time scale I said was about 500 years, the rotation period of the Earth is a day. So if you take the ratio of, you can define this thing called the Rossby number, which is extremely important in planetary dynamos and also stellar dynamos. It quantifies the um, influence of rotation on the convection. So it's basically, it's, it's a velocity scale divided by two times the rotation rate times some length scale, which you can take to be the depth of the convection zone. And so that's equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi times the rotation period over the convection time scale. And if you work, put, put in one day for the rotation period and 500 years for the convective time scale, you get a Rossby number of something like 10 to the minus 7. 
very tiny, which means, so Rossby number less than one means that the convection really feels the rotation rate. Yes? How do we know the velocity? Yeah, that's a good question. It, you can estimate it from the heat flux and how, how, what, what kind of velocity you need to carry out the heat flux. But you can, also, you can also infer, based on the evolution of the magnetic field at the surface, you can map that back to the core and get some measurement of velocities um, of what, of, at, near the core mantle boundary, near the top of, of the core. Um, but, but most of it, there's, there's some uncertainty there of what, what, are, what are the velocities. And that's true for all the planets. There's a lot of uncertainty on what, what velocities to use. But you can make different, um, you can make, so mixing length theory gives, if you know the luminosity or the heat flux through mixing length theory can give you an estimate of velocity. Uh, and later the dynamical balance or something called Mach balance. So if you know the magnetic field strength, you can estimate, and the rotation rate, you can estimate what the velocity might be. All right, so uh, what's often done in planetary dynamos is you expand the, the surface field in terms of spherical harmonics. So these are different spherical harmonics. Uh, spherical harmonics are characterized by an L and an M. Uh, the L is the total wave number, M is the azimuthal wave, wave number. So M equals zero are so-called zonal modes. They're east-west modes. L equals zero, and M equals zero is uh, uh, spherically symmetric. But then as you go to higher Ls for M equals zero, you get, you get different um, stripes in east-west. For L equals M, you get stripes in north-south. And as you increase the wave number, you get more stripes. And then these tesseral modes are sort of like uh, soccer ball modes. But the, the key here is that uh, if, if, if you have the top of the dynamo and you, if you have no currents above the top of the dynamo, if you assume that there's no electrical currents, then uh, the radial field falls off is r to the minus l plus 2. So for example, l equals 1 is a dipole. So a dipole field falls, falls off as r to the minus 3, but one of these tesseral modes, like L equals 5, will fall off as R to the minus 7. So as you go far enough away, it's the, it's the dipole that always dominates. So you can use this, and this is often done since, since dynamos are usually buried below the surface of planets. You can use it to, measure, to track the, uh, extrapolate the surface field down to where the dynamo is actually operating. So this is the surface field of the Earth. But if you assume this BR goes as R to the minus L plus 2, then you can decompose this into spherical harmonics and trace it back to what's going on at the top of the core mantle boundary, which is the top of the dynamo. So you have, so it looks a little less dipolar down here, more complicated uh, higher order harmonics. Um, so the energy sources for the Earth's dynamo, the uh, Outward heat transport just by, uh, by conduction, just the, yes? That's at the surface, yeah. Yeah, so it's less, that's a good point, yeah. The, the dipolarity uh, is usually measured at the surface, but when you, tra when, when you trace it back to where the dynamo is, it's, it's, it's gonna be smaller. Um, yeah, so the, there are uh, different heat sources for the Earth. Uh, one of it is just the secular cooling. Just uh, as when the Earth formed, the gravitational collapse heated up the material that formed the early Earth, and it's still cooling off from that, from that early formation. And so that's part of the heat flux that, that drives the convection. There's also a planing of the heat. The inner core is growing. So as the Earth cools down, the uh, plating of the liquid iron onto the solid iron is still occurring, and that releases energy. And this actually might be the uh, biggest source. These top two are the biggest source. There's also some amount of gravitational differentiation. There, there's heavy elements falling down, lighter elements rising to the surface. That releases some energy. And there's a lot of radioactive elements, uh, heavy elements in the core of the Earth that are decaying, and that heats up the fluid as well. So all of these are important. Uh, so 
that's the Earth going on to Venus, the twin of Earth. But there's no field detected. V Venus doesn't have a dynamo. It's about the same size as the Earth, but no field detected. Any ideas why? Yeah, that's part of it. So no, no volcanoes. So what does that tell you about the surface? Yeah, it's not moving. It's not. So the Earth has plate tectonics, right? And that helps get the heat out. But if you have a rigid top, the, the uh, surface of Venus, the crust of Venus, is very brittle. And so it acts as a plug, and it inhibits the heat transport. So we think the interior of Venus is probably, it, it's molten, it's liquid, but there's not a lot of heat flux through it. So that means we, we needed, so it's conducting like the Earth, but, um, but it doesn't, it's probably not convecting. Uh, there may be no convection in the core, and also it may be so hot still that it doesn't even have a, a solid core. It might be fluid throughout. So the plating of iron onto the core doesn't happen, so that's, that's an energy source that the Earth has that Venus doesn't. Yeah, but if you wait a long time, eventually, um, if, if you can get the heat out, then it might start convecting. But also, it has a very slow rotation. So rotation, as I said, can uh, promote dynamo action. How about Mars? It has um, sort of patchy fields, but no real dipole. So we don't think it has a dynamo. So why do you think Mars wouldn't have a dynamo? Yeah. Yeah, it's a smaller planet. Its interior has cooled and solidified. So there, there um, it's probably not liquid or, or not. It, the, the motions, uh, a lot of it has, has solidified. And it, it, it also has a low heat flux. So even if there is some molten parts, the heat flux isn't sufficient to drive conduction. All right, so but Mercury is a bit of a surprise. It has a dynamo. So all the planets other than Earth have something weird about their, their magnetic fields. Uh, in the case of Mercury, there's two strange things. First of all, it's very weak. And second of all, it's very asymmetric. So the uh, North Pole. Is a, or the northern hemisphere is about three times stronger than the southern hemisphere. So it's asymmetric about the equator, but it's very symmetric about the rotation axis. So it's a very small tilt, three degrees, and the dipolarity is more than Earth, more of a dipole. Um, so it's a bit of a, uh, so it has a huge iron core relative to the size of the planet. So that uh, is in part, iron has a high, uh, heat capacity, so that, that might be in part why it's retained its heat, even though it's smaller than Mars. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going on in the interior of Mercury. So I think the number of ideas about what's going on with the Mercury dynamo are, are higher than any other planet, because th there's all sorts of ideas that it might happen in a thin shell, it might happen in a deep shell with, with asymmetric plumes might happen deep down. There's some uh, libration me measurements that the, at least part of the interior of Mercury is fluid. So, so we do think there is a convective dynamo operating somewhere, but there's a lot of uncertainty. So this, this is a paper from 2009. This was before uh, the MESSENGER mis mission went in orbit around Mercury uh, in 2011 and took better measurements of the gravitational field and the magnetic field. And I think it's, it's pointing more toward deep convection models than it is toward these shallow type models. That much of, much of the interior still seems to be liquid. Yes? No, well, that, that is sometimes fi found in numerical dynamo models. Yeah, so why the northern hemisphere is different from the southern hemisphere. So that, that um, that is, there's a number called the Rayleigh number that, that quantifies the buoyancy versus the dissipation. 
And that has to be big enough for convection to happen. If it's too small, then, uh, then the dissipation wins out over buoyancy. And it, it's possible that mercury, in, in, in some dynamo simulations, if you're close to the critical Rayleigh number, you can get into these hemispherical solutions where one, where one hemisphere is a lot stronger than the other hemisphere. So it may be indicating that um, mercury is just barely critical to, you know, if it cools off a little more, the convection might stop. But yeah, that's still an active area of research. Um, and another bit of a surprise is that Ganymede, so salty water, as I said, was a weak conductor, but, uh, and Ganymede is the biggest moon. It's one of Jupiter's moons. It's slightly bigger than Mercury, but it's a moon because it orbits, orbits Jupiter instead of uh, the sun. But uh, it has a field strength that's stronger than Mercury, actually. Uh, very dipolar field, uh, very small tilt, so it's very uh, axisymmetric. And, uh, so this is, this is a bit of a surprise that, that, that Ganymede has a field. Other, uh, other icy satellites do have magnetic fields, but they're not thought to have dynamos. That uh, these are induced magnetic fields from the passage through the magnetospheres of their planets. So Ganymede has a dynamo. Jupiter has a huge dynamo. Uh, so we, have, we now have uh, measurements from the Juno sp spacecraft that has an average field strength of about 7 Gauss, order of magnitude bigger than the Earth. Uh, it gets up to 20 Gauss near the poles. Dipolarity similar to Earth's, tilt similar to Earth. So this is an archetypical Jovian planet, huge magnetosphere. Uh, uh, Fran Bagenal, who will be uh, giving one of the lectures uh, this week, likes to point out that the magnetosphere of Jupiter is the biggest object in the solar system, bigger than the sun. But us solar physicists might point out that the heliosphere itself is a lot bigger than. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the interior of Jupiter it has a layer composed of, uh, so the, the surface is mostly hydrogen and helium gas. As you go down, uh, that becomes liquid. And as you go further down, uh, it becomes metallic. So, so hydrogen enters into a state where the Electrons can flow freely. Um, uh, currents can, can, can flow through the medium. So it's a liquid state, but it's a highly conducting state. And then the core is probably similar to a, a rock made of rocks and metals. So it probably has a core um, similar to the Earth, but, but with this huge envelope on top of it. Uh, uh, internal structure. So this is a phase diagram for hydrogen. Temperature versus pressure. So if you have the pressure and temperature high enough, this is where it behaves as a metal, a, a high conductor, electrical conductor. Here's where it's uh, non-metallic. So if you pick a, pick a pressure and you go down in temperature, um, it goes from a metallic fl fluid to a non-metallic fluid. And for uh, reasonably low temperatures and high pressures, it actually can, can form a solid. But th this, this line here, this, this um, solid black line is what we think the interior of Jupiter, how the temperature and pressure vary in the interior of Jupiter. So above a uh, pressure of about 20 gigapascals, you would think it would become metallic. And below that, it's, it's uh, non-metallic. So if you look at that happens at about, in the most recent models, 2012, the guess is that happens at about 0.9. So the, the solid core, or the, the iron and metal core, we don't know if it's really solid. It might be kind of slushy. But it, that, that happens around, um, that ends about 0.1 of the Jupiter radii. And then this whole region from 0.1 to 0.9 is quite low conductivity. This is the metallic hydrogen region. And then when you start going into the liquid hydrogen, but, um, but non-metallic, sort of a, a liquid molecular hydrogen, then the conductivity or the diffusivity goes up, so it skyrockets. There might be some dynamo action near the bottom of this layer, but by the time you get to the surface, it's not a good enough conductor. So this, this, is, this is when the magnetic Reynolds number, that RM, gets to be too small to support any kind of dynamo action. So the, the uh, Jovian dynamo is buried below the surface. This is what its uh, field looked like uh, pre-Juno. Um, 
this is from 2016, just before the Juno sp spacecraft visited Jupiter. So, uh, and then, so it's, so this is extrapolated to um, the surface or one, one radius of Jupiter. Uh, the initial results from Juno say that it's somewhat stronger than, um, than previously thought. And it's, it's patchy. The, it, the, so this is, um, this is, this solid line is the orbit of Juno as it passed through and it was measuring the magnetic fields. Uh, but it seemed to be more high order multipoles. It's not just the dipole. It's not just the tilted dipole. There are also uh, patches of magnetic field. And because of that one over r to the minus l plus two thing, that suggests that the, the Jupiter's dynamo might be relatively close to the surface. Like you might, may reach all the way out to 90% of the radius of Jupiter or perhaps more. Yes? Yeah, this seems kind of weird, the way that this was not smoothed at all. So they're, they're kind of inferring this. But, um, but Fran would know more about that than I, than I would. She's a co-I on the Juno mission. So when, you, when Fran, you can ask her about that when, uh, when she gives her, her talk. But yeah, so they, they didn't bother smoothing it because they were interested in the variations. They, they were inter in, interested in, in departures from the dipole. So they, they just, the, the way they extrapolated this data back onto the surface of Jupiter, um, they wanted to highlight the inhomogeneities. Uh, so Saturn, dipole field strength comparable to Earth on the surface, uh, pretty dipolar. Um, but the amazing thing here is that it's amazingly axisymmetric, which is a surprise. Why is that a surprise? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Cowling's theorem, as you just heard from Amitava, that uh, I'll, I'll go through this quick because you've already seen it. But the, the idea is that if you take the induction equation, if, if you say that B is axisymmetric, then you can take the longitudinal average of this thing. And you can express B as the curl of A phi plus B phi. This, can be, this is true of any divergenceless uh, axisymmetric vector. And then you can come up with an evolution equation. You can just plug this in, come up with an evolution equation for A. And here it is. If div V equals 0, which Cowling originally assumed, then if you integrate this over, uh, well, you can multiply it by A and integrate this over a shell. This term goes away, and this term you can show is negative. So the idea is that A will decay that the poloidal field will decay. And you can also show you can come up with an equation, a similar equation for B. And you can show that if, if A decreases, then B will also decrease. So, uh, so, and even if div V is not equal to 0, if you assume a steady state, so these time derivatives go away, that you can show that, that it, it's, it can't be maintained, that this, that this equation uh, is not consistent with a, uh, with a steady axisymmetric field. So the conclusion is that it's not possible for a dynamo to produce a, a field that's perfectly axisymmetric. So um, in terms of what's going on with Saturn, we'll come back to that. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, the weird thing here is they're, they're not very dipolar, and they have very high tilts. This is the surface fields. The uh, field strength is weaker than Jupiter and Saturn. But that's not too surprising. The most surprising thing about these is that they have dynamos at all. So they, have, they don't have metallic hydrogen. They have this mixture of water and methane and ammonia inside, so it's not as good of a conductor. And they have very low heat fluxes. So in, in the gas giants, the main sources of energy are this, just the secular cooling from their formation. And some of them are still contracting. Jupiter is still contracting. So that releases a lot of energy. Saturn has a lot of differentiation, heavier elements going down, lighter elements coming up. Uh, Neptune is still contracting. Uranus, we don't think is. So th they have very low heat fluxes. So it's, so it's uh, surprising that they have high enough magnetic Reynolds numbers to actually run a dynamo, but they do. All right, so understanding the dynamics, we have to go to the momentum equation. So since convection, uh, established by buoyancy, this, this buoyancy term is very important. 
And since the Rossby number is so tiny, this, um, this rotation term, the Coriolis term, is all important. The, uh, the uh, Coriolis term, the Coriolis accelerations happen on the, in the case of the Earth, they happen on the time scales of days. Jupiter's rotation period is even faster, like 10 hours. So Coriolis accelerations happen very fast, whereas the advective time scales, for example, for this term, happen over hundreds of years or thousands of years. So the Coriolis term is much bigger than these inertial terms. And also the viscous diffusion is very small. You, yeah, this is usually uh, quantified by the Ekman number, which is the ratio of the viscous diffusion over the Coriolis force. The Rossby number was the ratio of uh, this term over the Coriolis force. And so both of these are very tiny <coughs> in, in planetary interiors. So that suggests a balance of the other terms. So that suggests a balance between the Coriolis term, the gravitational term, uh, the pressure gradient, and the magnetic term. And this is often called Mach balance, M for magnetic, uh, A for, Archimede Archimede for Archimedes, uh, Archimedean, if you can say that word. Uh, that, that's, that's gravity, that's the buoyancy, and then the Coriolis force. And then pressure is always in there. But you can remove pressure if you take the curl of this equation. Often what you do is you study the vorticity equation. So you um, take the curl of this equation, and the curl of a gradient goes away. So you have just a balance between these three terms. And then so that, so that can tell us a lot. A lot of the uh, sort of theoretical um, progress we can make on planetary dynamos relies on this balance. And we also rely from the conservation of mass equation. Uh, we often, there's something called the analastic approximation, which is you, you assume that the background state is uh, roughly hydrostatic and adiabatic. And then you consider perturbations. So the density, you consider density, temperature, pressure, entropy as perturbations about this hydrostatic background. So this little hat means the hydrostatic background. And then if you put it into the mass continuity equation, then if you have small Mach numbers, you can say that the mass flux, the divergence in the mass flux is zero. So what comes up comes down, that you don't have any compression anywhere. You just have mass flux flowing up and down and around. Uh, if in addition to a small Mach number, you have a density scale height that's much larger than the depth of your convective layer, then the Boussinesque approximation holds, holds that the divergence of the velocity field itself is zero. So again, you see a lot of uh, theory assume this. Um, so if you take this equation and for, uh, I, I, if you neglect the magnetic fields, then just this balance is known as geostrophic balance. But if you say grad, if you assume that grad rho is mainly radial, and you take the curl of this equation so the pressure goes away, then you come up with the result that omega dot grad, this, this term here comes into a omega dot grad, oh, take the phi component of the curl, and it comes into omega dot grad rho v equals zero. The Boussinesque version is dv dz equals zero, where z is the direction of the rotation axis. So this says that rapidly rotating flows tend to align with the rotation axis. And just to wake you up a little bit <laughs> and give you something to do, so let's say, so you can take out a piece of paper, you can do this on your own, or you can do this with talking with the, with the person next to you. But let's say you have a spherical shell of fluid that's heated from below, cooled on the top, so gravity is, toward the, uh, toward, gravity is down, but how can you get the heat out while satisfying Taylor Proudman theorem? So that the velocity is independent of z, the rotation axis, but you still have to, you have to get the heat out with convection. So I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. Good, take out a piece of paper, and you can work on this, again, with yourself or with the, with the person next to you. You may have already seen some of this yesterday, but just to get you moving a little bit. And 
yeah, let me know uh, if you have any questions. Basically, you want to draw a flow field that goes up and down and carries the heat out, but is independent of Z. And the question is, can you do that? Or how close can you get to it? What was the previous slide? Yeah, I don't know if that helps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. That's independent of Z. But does it get the warm fluid from the bottom to the top? So you want to simultaneously get the warm fluid from the bottom to the top and have a flow that's independent of Z. Yeah you, yeah, you can do that. You can do that. That works at the poles. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, this is it. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it helps if you've seen this before, but... It might help to think about this picture of hot fluid going up, cold fluid going down. Give you a, about two more minutes. I'll give you another hint. So think about cutting through the equator and looking down from the North Pole, being this. So this would be radius. This would be longitude. So you're kind of looking down, cutting through here, and looking down from the North Pole, and you see this at the equator. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's right. All right, are you ready for the answer? <laughs> yeah, but that does depend on Z a little bit. Because, it, because here it's... Here it's going this way, and then slightly higher layer, it's going the other way. So, no, that's that's the mathematical representation. I, I mean, omega dot grad v equals z equals zero is basically a Taylor problem theorem. Yep, yeah, these are Taylor columns. So, you ready for the answer? Then does your picture look anything like that? <laughs> so this is, this is the theory worked out by Fritz Busse in 1970. So these are the most unstable convective modes in a rapidly rotating spherical shell. 
So if you, like I said, if you cut it at the equator, it looks like just a series of those little rolls. But then it is roughly independent of z, but it can't be independent of z any, anywhere because it slaps, it smacks into this curved upper boundary. So it's not, this is as close as the convection can get to being independent of z. Uh, the preferred wave number, it, it likes to be smaller and smaller because if you think about a really fat one that goes from the bottom of the convection zone all the way to the top, it's going to have a big z dependence because the, the top boundary is going to change a lot. So it, it helps that these things are smaller and smaller and smaller, but as you make them smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually viscous diffusion will kill you. So the, most, the preferred wave number depends on the Ekman number. It's the balance of the Coriolis force and viscous dissipation. So the preferred wave number M scales in, as Ekman number to the minus one third. So this results in, you might have also drawn a picture like this. At the poles, just going radially, just going from the bottom to the top, you don't cross the rotation axis. Omega cross V is zero. So you can, you can go right up and not feel the Coriolis force at all. But then mass conservation, div rho view equals zero, you have to turn over and come back down at some point. So here, here the flow is going to the left, here it's going to the right. So there is a dv dz. There is a z dependence. And out here is where the banana cells live, these Boosie columns. Uh, outside what's called the tangent cylinder. So the tangent cylinder is a cylinder, cylindrical surface that's aligned with the rotation axis and tangent to the lower boundary of the convection zone. So this really delineates two different dynamical regimes for the convection. You have polar modes and you have equatorial modes. So banana cells live out here. And then up here you have long, skinny um, convection cells that are more vert vertically oriented. And another cool thing about these is they are traveling waves. They're called thermal Rossby waves because there's something called like the potential vorticity, which is the z component of the vorticity divided by like the height of a cylinder. So you can do this in the lab. Uh, from the point of view of the Boosie columns, the spherical surface is just a lot like a cylindrical annulus. They don't care about the poles. They just go up and down. And uh, they feel the tilt of the outer boundary. So if they move a little farther away from the rotation axis, they get squashed. And then conservation of angular momentum, they have, to, they have to spin down a little bit. And then if they, go, if they go closer to the rotation axis, they get stretched out and they spin up because they conserve their local angular momentum. And that gives you a wave propagation. So these things propagate in a posit positive uh, longitudinal direction. So they propagate from west to east. And you can work it out. The simplest example, if you assume a Boussinesque fluid, centrifugal gravity, so gravity directed outward, um, in local linear perturbations, then the phase velocity of the traveling modes is just proportional to the rotation rate and the tangent of the angle of that slope. And if you slope it the other way, so, so it's a concave slope associated with the spherical surface, but if you slope it the other way, they go the other way. So density, a density stratification can have a similar effect of making them go prograde. All right, so that's linear theory, but to get to nonlinear regimes, you need uh, numerical simulations. These solve the MHD equations in a rotating spherical shell using the analastic or the Boussinesque approximation. So all the thermodynamic variables are linear perturbations about a hydrostatic adiabatic background state, and they're convection simulations. In some way, they have heating from below and cooling from above. Sometimes it's just at the inner boundary, the heating. Sometimes it's distributed throughout the shell, like for radioactive elements. But there's some, there's some amount of heating and cooling. Uh, so, when, so there's linear theory that, that, that predicts that alignment with the rotation axis. But when you go to much uh, more turbulent parameter regimes, low Ekman numbers, you still get alignment with the rotation axis. You don't have these simple laminar columns, but they, it, come, it looks more like vortex sheets, that you have these plumes coming up from the hot inner, inner boundary, but they're still, they still follow that taylor Proudman theorem. They still want to align with the rotation axis. Yes?
Yeah, this, uh, in the mantle, in the mantle it's very different because it's very viscous. So the Ekman number is a lot, is a lot bigger. So it, it's a very viscous fluid. Uh, so there you talk about the Reynolds number, which is the V dot grad V term divided by the diffusion term. And there, I think it's on the order of one, maybe, maybe more, or I mean maybe less. So I, I don't really know much about mantle convection, but it's, but it, it, it's, high, it's highly viscous. A, and there's a big change in the, in the conductivity and the viscosity with depth, the thermal conductivity. So there are funny things. There, there, you, get, there you get these big plumes that come up from the um, bottom of the mantle. But, so you get this alignment uh, even in turbulent parameter regimes and even when you go to MHD. So when you include magnetic fields, you still see this alignment. These are uh, different ra rally numbers. As I said, the rally number is a quantification of the buoyancy driving over the viscous and thermal dissipation. So if the viscosity is high, like molasses, or if the thermal conductivity is high, then a warm plume rising up from the bottom will lose its heat very rapidly, so you won't get convection. So any kind of dissipation will, uh, so this rally number has to be above a critical rally number for you to have convection. So any kind of high dissipation will kill convection. So, uh, so different, this is a rally number of 10 to the fifth, this is 10 to the seventh. You go to higher rally numbers, you get more complicated flows, but they still tend to align with the rotation axis. Um, and these Boosie columns, are really good at making dipolar fields because they, they have, they, they have, so there's a sequence of alternating cyclones and anticyclones. So cyclone has uh, counterclockwise, if you're looking down from the North Pole, it has a counterclockwise rotation the same direction as omega. A cyclone has the opposite direction of omega. And so they have, they have flows within them. So they have flows in this direction, but also cyclone has a flow toward the equator and anticyclone has a flow away from the equator. So if you, number one here, if there's a toroidal field line that's, that's threading through them, they get spun up into these whirls, into these vortices, but they also get stretched out. So you can create a poloidal field from a toroidal field. So this, is, this works a lot like the alpha effect that, um, that Amitava was talking about. And I love this, this looks like hair plugs uh, so, so this is a simulation by Kagiyama and Sato uh, from 97, but these are at the top of these anticyclones. You have these magnetic fields that are sprouting out from the top of the anticyclone. So you can look at general trends. As you increase the rotation in these models, so this is the Rossby number, this is a measure of the Rossby number. So this is uh, low Rossby number means very rotationally constrained. Rossby numbers approaching one or more means uh, the convective time scales are now comparable to the rotation period, so it doesn't feel the rotation as much. Uh, but these are different Ekman numbers, different viscosities. But the idea is that, so, and this is the dipole fraction, uh, the fraction of the magnetic energy in the dipole component. So for low Rossby number, it's very close to one, between 80% and 100% of the energy is in the dipole component, whereas for larger Rossby numbers, lower rotational influence, you have, it's more like 0.2. So these are multipolar dynamos, these are dipolar dynamos. So if you spin it up enough, you have these busy columns, they're good at making dipole fields. Um, all right, so you can also look at scalings in these models. So here's a question again. So if you have a Mac balance here, so how would you th expect the ratio of magnetic energy to kinetic energy, how would it scale with the Rossby number? So this is the Rossby number here. J is curl B. Magnetic energy goes like B squared. Kinetic energy goes like 1 half rho V squared. So you can, I'll give you a few, few minutes to do this calculation.
And this is good, good practice in MHD or fluid dynamics. The, it, a lot of it's based on these dynamical balances and the non-dimensionalization of different terms and looking at which terms dominate, which terms scale with others. All right, we ready or do you want more time? I'll give another minute. I see, I see people still writing. Okay, anybody want to give an answer? There you go. There's an answer here. Inverse of the Rossby number. That's right. Yeah, so if you, again, you can take the curl of this equation and the pressure term goes away. And if you assume that the, the density is mainly radial like we did before, then it's just a balance between these two terms. And so the, if you work it out, you should have found that the magnetic energy of the kinetic energy goes as Rossby number to the minus 1. So remember, the Rossby number in the Earth's core is like 10 to the minus 7, or 10 to the minus 6, and similar for other planets. So that suggests the magnetic energy, the energy of the magnetic field, is orders of magnitude bigger than the kinetic energy in the convection. So that's an important result. <coughs> um, that is contingent on Mach balance, which there's some, there's some debate on whether that's really satisfied. Uh, there, there could be. So the terms that are, remember the terms that we've left out here, there's a V dot grad V term, uh, uh, advection, nonlinear advection of momentum that could be important. And there's a viscous dis diffusion term, which is probably not important in planets, but in simulations it might be. There, there's, some, there's some evidence that that, that contributes to, um, so because this is, this, the Coriolis force is perpendicular to omega. So you have, so it doesn't contribute to the force balance uh, along parallel to omega. So in that direction, you might have the viscous diffusion kind of coming in and contributing to the force balance, which is not ideal. Um, but so that, so that gives us a scaling. But the, the, the main point is that in planetary dynamos, you expect the magnetic energy to be very strong like even stronger than the kinetic energy of the convection, even though it's produced by the convection. But, um, but we want to know how the magnetic energy depends on observable parameters like uh, the rotation rate and the heat flux coming through the system. I say in principle here, because the heat flux coming through the system is, is straightforward to do like in stars, because you see the, the sun shining. Uh, it can be estimated pretty well in the Earth's core. But it's very, it's very weakly constrained for planets like Uranus and Neptune. We don't know much about the heat flux going through them. But you can, in principle, observe the uh, rotation rate and the heat flux. So we want to know how the magnetic energy scales with things like this. Uh, but we would have to know how the Rossby number itself will depend on these things. And the kinetic energy will depend on these things. So this little relation here is very instructive, but it doesn't tell, we, tell us really what we want to know is how the magnetic energy depends on global parameters. And it turns out that there's an argument that these things don't depend on the rotation rate at all. So the magnetic energy seems to scale with the heat flux. So here, so this axis is the it's a non-dimensional magnetic energy in numerical simulations, dynamo simulations. And this axis is, uh, the main thing here is Q. So it goes as heat flux to the 2 thirds power. And these are simulations with a range of different Ekman numbers, and they all seem to, to fall on this line. So these rapidly rotating dynamos seem to be operating at maximum efficiency. So the, the magnetic field strength is really dependent on the heat flux through the system. 
So the bigger the heat flux, the more energy they can tap, and the stronger the fields will be. And so this seems to, it, it's a big stretch between the Earth, Jupiter, and rapidly rotating stars. But the claim is that that also applies to rapidly rotating stars. So this is a Nature paper from 2009. And they take the scaling. They estimate Earth and Jupiter are the planets that we can constrain the heat flux the best. The other, the other planets, we don't have a good idea what the heat flux is. But if you plug in the heat flux and you measure the magnetic fields and you plot them versus heat flux versus, sorry, magnetic field versus heat flux to the 2 thirds power, there's also a density in there, um, then they seem, again, this is a log-log plot going over six orders of magnitude, so don't take it uh, as uh, faith. All right. But it, they seem to lie on the same line. So, so this suggests that these rapidly rotating stars and planets are operating in this re regime of maximum efficiency. They're, they're getting as much energy out of the luminosity through the cells, through the shell as they possibly can. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about these. Yeah, we, we can we, we can look it up, but uh, yeah. So so this this applies to rapidly rotating stars. So the sun is not considered to be in that regime, which I'll talk about after lunch, I guess. Um, the the sun. So this the the sun, the magnetic field. So this might be stars that are more slowly rotating. I'm not sure what these lines are. But this is this is kind of an upper limit to how much the magnetic energy can be. All right, so the challenge with numerical models is that the um, parameters that we can achieve with the models are nowhere close to what the real parameters are. So uh, this, this is the Rayleigh number, which uh, quantifies buoyancy versus dissipation. Here's the Ekman number, which quantifies the Coriolis force compared to the viscous force. This quantifies the advection versus the uh, magnetic uh, dissipation. And this magnetic Prandtl number, you may have seen this uh, already. Uh, th this is the viscous diffusion versus the uh, magnetic ohmic diffusion. And so these are, the Earth has, in Jupiter, have huge Rayleigh numbers. O other planets are similar. Uh, simulations, we can only get up to about 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7, orders of magnitude less than what the real planets are doing. Yes? Yeah, the question is, well, why can't we get higher than that? And, and the, the answer is it has to do with resolving scales, that as you go to more and more turbulent flows, you, you, you need higher and higher resolution. So, so the, the, the Rayleigh number and other things like the Reynolds number, which isn't on this, is related to the dynamic range of scales. You go from global scales to, to, to smaller scales. So in order to capture that range of scales, you need higher and higher resolution. And computers are only so big. So as you increase the resolution, if you double the resolution in three dimensions, that increases the computational workload by a factor of eight. But if you're using, uh, if you know numerical methods, there's also something called the CFL condition that says the time steps that you can take are limited. So that's another factor of two. So anytime you double the resolution in the simulation, you increase the computational workload by a factor of 16. So there's a lot of doubling in getting from 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 37. <laughs> So we probably won't, in any of our lifetimes, be able to do direct numerical simulations of planets. Um, and similar for the Ekman number. The, the Earth is 10 to the minus 15, which is um, ridiculous. And uh, simulations can get down to 10 to the minus 6, usually. Uh, but the, the saving grace for planetary dynamos is that the magnetic Reynolds number is in the regime, usually, of what we can simulate. So this is important. That's not true for stars. Uh, and magnetic parallel numbers are very low, uh, much lower than we can simulate. So 
the, the question is, do these, do these really apply? And we seem to do a pretty good job with the planets if you get some dynamical balances right. So if you get in the right Rossby number regime, so if you get the Rossby number that you think the planet is really at, then, and a reasonable um, Reynolds number, and a reasonable, or, or get the Ekman number, you can't achieve 10 to the minus 15. But if you at least get it low enough so that you get this, you achieve this Mach balance, or you achieve the right dynamical balances, then uh, they seem to do a pretty good job. And an example here is the geodynamo. So these are simulations of the geodynamo. Uh, so this is the observed, this is inferred from observation. So this is taking the surface field and extrapolating it back to the core mantle boundary. And then you can compare it with simulations. This is a simulation here that does a pretty good job. So you could, there's a lot of points of um, uh, uh, comparison uh, one is the field strength, one is the mortho morphology, how much is in the dipole, how much is in higher order multipoles. Uh, there's uh, symmetry about the equator. And reversal time scales, this is harder um, because it requires much longer simulation. So the convective time scale of the Earth was like 500 years, and the reversal time scale was 200,000 years. So you have to run a simulation a long time to really uh, quantify what the reversal time scale is. But, um, but so some of them seem to match the Earth pretty well. Other ones don't. This has a too small of a dipole. This had too, has too big of a dipole. Uh, but Christensen et al. claim that the best matches are those with Ekman number less than 10 to the 4. So you've got to get the diffusion, the vis viscosity low enough, and the uh, magnetic Reynolds number large enough. That the, what is large enough depends on the Ekman number and depends on the magnetic field strength. But, um, but if you have a low enough Ekman number and a high enough magnetic Reynolds number, you tend to uh, be able to do pretty well. Um, so, but you have to be careful because you want to say that, okay, the real Earth has a much higher Rayleigh number and a much lower Reynolds number, or sorry, much lower Ekman number than the simulations. So what happens if we increase the move toward more realistic parameter regimes? So let's increase the Rayleigh number and decrease the Ekman number. Both of these are theoretically closer to the geodynamo parameters than this one is, because they both have a higher Rayleigh number than this one and a lower Ekman number than that one. But they don't match as well. So we're in the situation that they, they can do a pretty good job, but they might possibly be right for the wrong reasons. So we have to, we have to be careful. But there are still promising bits. Uh, one of them is reversals. Uh, the first real reversal in a, in a geodynamo simulation was the Glassmeyer and Roberts 95. Um, but here the coupling to the inner core is crucial. So when they, they, they started their simulations with an insulating lower boundary, and they were finding the, the magnetic field was flipping every 1,000 years or so, too much. Uh, but then they included coupling to a solid conducting inner core of iron. And then, then they get sort of the right time scales. Again, you can't run these long enough to get really good statistics for the reversals. But, um, but it stabilized. It wasn't flipping every 1,000 years anymore. So the coupling to the inner core is crucial. Um, another example, Jupiter. Again, you can, get you can get simulations. So this is the inferred field from observations. This is the uh, simulated field. And they're uh, pretty good agreement. Similar field strength, similar uh, morphology in terms of the different multipoles, dipole versus quadrupole versus higher order. Um, so this is, this is the actual simulation. And then it's smoothed to. Um, it's moved to, I think, eight uh, spherical harmonic modes at L max of eight. But, um, but some of these look pretty good. But he was finding that dipole solutions are not easy to find for the parameter regimes you might guess are most fitting for, for Jupiter. So you, you can find that the, the message is that the simulations can reproduce fields pretty well. Um, but, you have, but again, is it for the right reasons? You, you, have, to, you have to be careful how you interpret them. Uh, there are other simulations that show uh, banded horizontal flows. 
So these are, so Jupiter, as we know, has east-west flows on the surface, zonal bands of flows, alternating east-west flows. And there are simulations that reproduce that. The surface magnetic fields in this particular simulation don't look very realistic compared to what Jupiter is. But, um, but you can have the coexistence of these zonal flows with a deep convection. And there's still, um, there, there's still some debate in the community of whether uh, these zonal flows result from these Boosey columns, they, these Taylor Proudman rotation states that penetrate into the deep interior. Or there's also others that say those cloud layers, we, that, those bands we see on the top, are really all neutral dynamics in the, in the upper atmosphere. So they're, they're a shallow layer like the Earth's atmosphere. And you generate, they're, they're essentially equivalent to jet stream in the ocean. So there's still, there's still that debate. Hopefully Juno will shed some light on that by figuring out how deep the surface east-west flows go. You can figure some of that out by measuring precisely the gravitational field. Um, so what was going on with Saturn? Why is this so axisymmetric? Um, one possibility is that the convection zone has a layer above it that's stable, but it has differential rotation. So there's no convection, but there's differential rotation. And differential rotation can, so, so this is what it looks like at the top of the dynamo region. This is from a numerical model by uh, Sabine Stanley. Uh, this is the top of the dynamo region at 0.5 uh, RS, that should be, uh, oh yes, Saturn now. Um, so this is the top of the, the dynamo region in Saturn, and this is the surface. So between where the dynamo operates and the surface, there might be this differential rotation that stretches out the field and, and axisymmetrizes it. Um, or it's a possibility there's another recent paper that says uh, it's maybe running a different type of dynamo, that it's mainly driven by shear rather than buoyancy. So you have a thick shell here, but near the tangent cylinder, you have a, a very strong shear, that, that there's slow differential rotation uh, above the, the core and faster uh, outside the tangent cylinder, and that shear creates strong polar fields. But this is still subject to Cowling's constraints. So this is, you, you still need small departures from axisymmetry of the magnetic field. All right, so some of the lessons learned uh, from numerical models. Uh, rapid rotation has a profound influence on the dynamics. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, and the success is attributed to the correct dynamical balances. If you can achieve this Mach balance, and other things like thermal wind balance and uh, a realistic magnetic Reynolds number, then they seem to do pretty well. Uh, but future challenges, again, a uh, really low Ekman number. We, we don't really know if we would get the same thing. If we could decrease the viscosity by six orders of magnitude, would we get the same thing, or three orders of magnitude? Um, and there's a pe peculiarities of particular planets. Like um, the Earth, I said, the, including the conducting uh, iron core, the solid iron core was key to getting the right reversal time scale. In Saturn, the inclusion of a uh, non-convecting layer with differential rotation might be required to, to explain the axisymmetry. So, uh, and Mercury also, and Ganymede also, have, have uh, boundary conditions that can help uh, determine what the flow, what the magnetic topology is like. There's rapid variations of the diffusion, the magnetic diffusion. Clarifying what the energy source is, especially for Uranus and Neptune, what the, energy, what the heat flux is through them. And the role of compositional convection, I didn't really talk about that, but this idea that, that heavy elements can fall and light elements can rise, that can give you a buoyancy independent of the thermal buoyancy. Um, but, um, and this idea of moving to more realistic parameters doesn't always make the solution better. Like if you make the, the rally number bigger, you might go from a dipole to a multipole and lose your agreement with, um, with the planet you're trying to simulate. So trying to understand all those things is, uh, is a challenge. Um, but I thought I'd leave you. 
I started with Juno, and I thought, thought I'd leave you with uh, coming back to Juno. So this is a polar view of what's going on uh, at the poles of Jupiter. So these uh, white regions, I believe the right, white regions are anticyclones, and the blue regions are cyclones. Or anyway, you get you get a lot of uh, vorticity. This is a uh, simulation from Nick Featherstone here at, at Colorado. This is a high resolution numerical simulation. Let's see. So the blue ones are counterclockwise. Yes, these are anticyclones. So these are the rotation rates. So this is looking down at the North Pole. So you get all these little vortices. So when you drew your little convective motions at the poles inside the tangent cylinder, you, you found that the, the way to minimize the Coriolis force on them is to have these long, skinny convection cells. But when those, those have to overturn, and when they overturn, the Coriolis force makes them, makes them spin. So you get, uh, you get a lot of these small little vortices that are sort of swirling around. So I'll, I will, that, that's, I'll, I'll leave you with that, and, um, but happy to answer any questions you might have. This here? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I, I assume that's uh, a false color. But, um, but yeah, you can ask Fran that, because she knows more about Juno than I do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is from um, the JPL NASA NASA Photo Journal. So, um, but yeah, it is probably a composite image. It's probably diff a couple different uh, channels that are, that are combined. But but here here in this again, you see th this is the tangent cylinder. So, so you, you that that's again an indication of the role of rotation. That that. Equatorial modes outside the tangent cylinder have a very different structure than the polar modes. So, um, so where the bottom of the convection zone is uh, makes a big difference, and that that's true in stars too. That that stars have different depths of uh, convection zones. That uh, low mass stars, M stars, are fully convective from the core to the surface, and the the sun has convection in its outer thirty percent, and. Uh, and massive stars like like A-type stars are inverted suns, so they have uh, convection in their cores and stable envelopes. But that's that's all I have. So any other questions? We can. Yes. Speculative ones are good. Planet X. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Exoplanets, and uh, so um, so again, a giant planet like Jupiter is is still contracting, so it, it it's it gives off more infrared radiation than the sun. Than, than is accounted for by solar heating. So they're, they're, it's shining in, in the infrared. It's giving off more heat than it's receiving from the sun. Uh, and, and that might be true. So, so it, it, relies, it doesn't re re rely on sunlight at all. It relies on its own internal heat. So you could, in principle, have a gas giant planet that's way out that would have a magnetic field. But, um, but the question is, how would it form out there? The, the, the densities of the disk around the Earth wouldn't be sufficient to form a big planet. But, but I don't know much about Planet 9. How big is it supposed to be? <laughs> and 10 Earth masses. And is it supposed to be terrestrial? Or what? <laughs> So it's, 
Yeah, so it's, it's probably icy. So uh, Ganymede is an icy moon that does have a dynamo, but that gets a lot of tidal heating from Jupiter. Yeah, they? <laughs> but yeah, you can come up with, based on these results, so I, I, I talked about the solar system. I did not talk about uh, extrasolar planets at all. But, um, but there's a whole range of behaviors you can, you can expect to get in extrasolar planets. Like I said, if you're close, if, if you have a weak heat flux and a low conductivity, you might be close to the critical Reynolds number or critical um, Rayleigh number. So you can expect to th see things like asymmetries there, north-south asymmetries. Um, and then coupling to different types of layers, if you have a insulating layer versus uh, iron core can make a difference on, on how the, is, especially with reversals. Uh, and, and also, there's a question of, um, you know, Juno measured the uh, magnetic field of Jupiter um, last year, and it was stronger than expected. But, um, but is that because we underestimated it before, or that's, is that because it's evolving? And you know, we have no idea whether if the uh, magnetic fields of the planets reverse or not. <laughs> that a lot of the numerical models, if they're rotating fast enough, they tend not to reverse much. Um, if they do reverse, it's usually irregular, unlike the sun. The sun has relative clockwork every 11 years it flips. Um, but these rapidly rotating models tend to be uh, more irregular. Yes? Yeah, that, that um, yeah, so I'll re repeat the question because it's a, an important one. Is why, why, do, why does the Earth dynamo re uh, flip uh, irregularly on a very long time scale compared to the rotation period? And compared to the, so the rotation period is one day, convective time scale is 500 years, the flip, the flip time scale is 200,000 years. Whereas in the sun, the rotation period and the convective time scale, both about a month, they're comparable. And the flipping is 11 years, which is two orders of magnitude larger, but still not, the difference is still much less than the Earth. So the Earth's dipole is much more stable than the Sun's is. And the short answer is we don't really have, uh, we don't really know what causes the solar field to reverse. There are some theories that I'll talk about after lunch. Um, but, um, but we do know that rapidly rotating stars, if we look at observations of rapidly rotating stars and look for cycles in rapidly rotating stars, that there, there are, we do infer some reversals. Or we, we, can't refer, we, we can't infer reversals, but we can infer um, cyclic variation of magnetic proxies. So we, we don't know that they're reversing. We, we infer that they're reversing, but they're varying on, on time scales. And, uh, and the rapid rotators, there are some exceptions, but as a rule, they tend to be more irregular than something like the sun. They, 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 have, they have variability, but not, not a regular 11-year cycle like the sun does. So those might be, and, and also, they seem to be operating at maximum efficiency, if we go back to this plot. You know, it's the rapid rotators that lie in this plot. So the, the most rapidly rotating stars may be more analogous to planets. So they're, 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 in, they're in very low Rossby number regimes. And the, when, you're, when you're very rapidly rotating, you tend to create a dipole field that's, that's pretty stable. So, and, uh, and it flips occasionally, but irregularly. But that's the, uh, and, and like I said, the, the conducting core of the Earth helps stabilize it. So without the iron core of the Earth, it would flip a lot more frequently. But that's about the best answer I have. That, that um, it, it's still, it's still, so we're still, that there's a lot of work on planetary dynamos that really focuses on 
the getting the, the strength of the magnetic field right and the topology of the field right, we know less, much less about magnetic cycles because they're very challenging to do. You know, running a simulation, if, you, if you're doing it, if you're um, doing the Coriolis force in a numerical model explicitly, you need time steps of less than a day. So run that model 200,000 years, or if you want, say, 10 reversals, run it 2 million years. <laughs> and then come back to me when you're done, and we'll give you a PhD thesis. <laughs> yes? The geodynamo are irregular. Oh, the, the geodynamos, yeah, tend to be irregular, yeah. So these, so yeah, there are more, more simulations. So 1995 was the first real, um, the first real reversal scene in a in a geodynamo. That was the landmark paper by Glassmeyer and Roberts. Go back to geodynamo. Let's see, it was here. Yeah, so this, this paper, this 1999 paper, they have a little more examples. So this is a, this is a reversal. And they have, they have others. So, th so this is a more careful study about uh, basically how the, uh, how the homogeneity of the heat flux in the inner core um, affects their reversal rate. And here they consider like eight simulations. Seven of them had several reversals. So, <laughs> so the, the most any simulation has achieved is, is a few reversals. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to really get a time scale. You, you can say, if, it, if it's obviously going too fast, you can stay, say that. But it's hard to get statistics and, and really compare that with what the geodynamo is doing. But, um, but for those who, that do exhibit reversals, they do tend to be irregular. They're not, they're not periodic. For, you, you can get idealized simulations that do have more periodic reversals. But if you're trying to plug in the best physics you know for the geodynamo, I'm not aware of any that have regular reversals. Yeah. Is there a question? In planets? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. If they're yeah, so that that's another thing. So this afternoon in the lab, you'll play a little bit with alpha omega dynamo models. So, yeah, the point is, if there are if there are regular if there's a regular periodicity, it kind of suggests a linearity that it, it's hard to get. Not impossible. You can't rule it out, but but. If the thing is a turbulent chaotic mess, then you might not expect to have a really regular period. What, what the kinds of models that give very regular periods um, tend to be those in which shear plays a big role, differential rotation. So you have, well, we'll play with alpha omega dynamo models this, this afternoon in the lab. And those are the best at, at, giving, at giving cycles. Those are the best kind of idealized models that, so if you create Poloidal field with an alpha effect and toroidal field with the shear, then you can get dynamo waves. That you can get propagation of dynamo modes, which is linked to oscillatory solutions of the induction equation. So th those um, those tend to be more cyclic. Whereas there are also alpha squared dynamos, where you create so so you can lift and twist poloidal field, and you can lift and twist toroidal field, and convert between them. And that's been applied to try to understand some stars. Um, but those tend to give you steady solutions. And you can, you know, I, there's a homework set I can give you if you want it, that you can, you can easily demonstrate that analytically in a simple dynamo model, that alpha squared tend to be steady, whereas alpha omega dynamo models, if differential rotation plays a big role, then, um, then you tend to get more oscillatory ones. So that's another reason that can explain the, uh, the differential or the different behavior of stars versus planets. We said in this little activity that the magnetic energy 
is huge compared to the kinetic energy of the convection. So in planets, this tends to ratchet down the differential rotation. If you have uh, magnetic fields have tension in them. And if you have really strong, it's like a spaghetti of magnetic field lines with, with magnetic tension. So, uh, so in planetary dynamos, differential rotation plays much less of a role. It's, it's not completely absent, but, um, but we'll see in the sun, differential rotation is crucial to get things, things like cycles. So, um, but the magnetic energy is so overwhelming in, in planetary uh, cores, uh, planetary convection zones, that it tends, that it, it's hard to maintain a differential rotation. It just wipes it out. 